Hey Brick Maniacs, welcome back to another uh, Designer Studio episode. I know we've had Mary in here quite a bit because she's been taking the, the brunt of Great War Bricks, <laughs> but now we've, we've, we've come to another Siskin creation. This is the SE5A, once again for Great War Brick Months, uh, chugging through in November. Uh, so this one's sold out in its pre-order, um, but its release week is upon us. Um, this is a pretty cool undertaking because like we were discussing before we started rolling here, this has the most UV printing of any World War I aircraft or maybe even World War I kit. We've we've released Could well be probably not the war spite but still but that's not out yet <laughs> yeah right yeah right that's next week still up, up to this point each week right yeah, up to this point so yeah it's, it's a lot of printing we're, we're, we we have some new machines so we're trying some new things out and, and one of them is this this crazy printing the roundel printing mm -hmm. on the top here um, that was printed as one unit but they are separate pieces right um, you have to build it um, actually we what we do is we print it built and then throw in an extra piece so you get them, they're already printed. So like if you want to, if, if for some reason the registration wasn't perfect, mm -hmm. though at least you'll get the, the, the nine elements that were printed together. So that's yeah. nine elements printed all at once. Um, they're, this one, they're perfect. They're perfectly centered. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a really good job. I'm assuming they're all that way. I haven't, I haven't mm -hmm. seen. Typically speaking, when we print one one way, they all print the same way. Yeah, sure. The same, Not a lot the of same, discrepancy. The same setup for each one. So um, yeah, so th those are printed on top. It's cool, really cool. The piece on the side here, this this it's it's multiple pieces actually. You have the little the, the British rondelle. Mm -hmm. um, that's the Royal Air Corps, Royal Flying Corps, uh, pre predecessor to the Royal Air Force. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then the Z is the is a so you have the hexagon representing I think the unit number. Yep. Uh, which is the eighty. This particular line is the eighty fifth squadron. Mm -hmm. The Z is the plane, and then the, of course the British Rondell. Uh, then there's a serial and a tail number. That is actually a sticker because it crosses yes. way too many plates. Uh, there's like no way we're going to be able to. I mean, we could print it, but it would. It, <laughs> yeah. Right. It, the, the the every time you cross a section like this, uh, it creates a headache. Mm -hmm. Tiles and tiles and slopes are easy because they are you know they line up perfectly. When you start printing on the sides of plates, it gets to be well. There's a significant uh, a cost trade off there too, and so if you if you want to be able to print that kind of stuff, obviously you take the time to be able to do that. But then that cost rolls over into the model, especially for something that is of that size. <laughs> we have to be, pretty much ship it put together. Yeah, <laughs> right. You, you you take what you can get in in that right. sense. I think for sure. There are uh, some other printed elements. The uh, um, the, the the propeller that's nothing new we've done that mm -hmm. one before but I like the the what is it the, the radiator yeah yeah so this is the, has, this this is the SE five so let's just a little let's just back up a little bit to the history of the SE five so um, during World War One it was you know a, an ever escalating air war mm -hmm. and the British government was basically and the Allies were looking for the you know always to improve their fighters. Um, you know, at the time, the, the Saab of Camel and the, the Newport 17 were kind of the state-of-the-art fighters. Mm -hmm. And the SE-5 was the other one that was sort of up and coming. And they, they built this plane, had a great, it had a French engine, and it was, it was a really good design. Um, so the SE-5, but it took a while to get into production because there was an engine shortage. Okay. And they changed the engine out for this Wolseley Viper engine, this 200 horsepower engine. Up until that point, there had not been a 200 horsepower engine in an aircraft, especially a fighter aircraft, mm -hmm. in, in in World War One. So it's quick. So it's fast. They mm -hmm. they call this once once they start, started getting these new engines and got it into cranking up the production. Like this is like the last six months of the war. Mm -hmm. uh, they came out with this airplane. This 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 was the premier frontline fighter at the end of the war. It beat oh, everything. Cool. So sure. it was. It was it was better than the Spad. The Tide Turner kind yeah, of yeah yeah. I mean it was you almost could say it, it didn't really make all that much difference in the war, but every time it went up, they when they when they encountered the enemy, this thing just it get outperformed. Mm -hmm. them. It certainly served our Canadian ace quite well. We'll have landed right. in to talk about that later. Right, right. The Billy Bishop. <laughs> yeah, he was kind of like the, the the top the top ace of Canada, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uniquely a lone wolf. Uh, well. Fighter that he'd go out and, and kind of a cool guy. They they would you know it's it's not normal that you would let a pilot go out on his own, mm -hmm. um, but he actually had a lot of success. You know you could always question whether it was real because yeah. you could always when I mean, you're the only one. I there, shot down could, five planes today. Yeah right. right. <laughs> but he does he, he he was already an ace confirmed ace mm -hmm. before that ever happened. So well, that that's that's something for the historians to talk about. Exactly. We're just talking about the model. we can focus on the Lego aspect, right. which is a cool plane. Right and and we the reason we picked. This plane, I mean, this is actually Billy Bishop's plane. Right. He was the squadron commander of the 85th Squadron at the end of the war. They had just transitioned from the Newport, mm -hmm. um, the Newport 17, the French French plane. And uh, he was there, squadron leader. This is his plane. The Z was his was his uh, his, his actual plane. Um, 
we wanted to do something a little different. And we've never, you know, we've we've always we've 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 sort of covered, you know, the Americans, the the British, and now mm -hmm. it's time to, to to give our Canadian friends some some of the some of the, the justice they deserve. I yeah, guess. absolutely. It was it was a cool role to play, and not only that, but you know, World War One month, I think is a really good time to explore some of those aspects of the Great War that maybe people aren't super familiar with. And I think a Canadian ace leading a British squadron would definitely be one of those. Well, and, and it's one thing in both World War One and World War Two, the Canadians were in the war way mm -hmm. longer than the Americans. So by the time the Americans joined the fight, the Canadians already been in the war for three years. Right. Already lost you know hundreds of thousands of men uh, in, in combat. And so they had you know arguably a greater contribution to the outcome of the war than mm -hmm. than, than us americans did but uh, stronger european ties at that point still as well i suppose well and i, and I think somehow legally technically they still are part of the british right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean back then they were just definitely part of england right. it was it, the great britain the, the united kingdom that sort of so to speak mm -hmm. so. well a cool kind of end of the evolution of aircraft let's flip that around and show off the uh, cockpit a little bit too because right, we right. got another it, printed element it, in it there. is a printed element I, there's there's a there's a Oh, a lever in there that's the, the control stick. Mm -hmm. Let me put this down. So Who doesn't like having a joystick in your car? Right, right. Come on. So, but there is a printed dashboard, which mm -hmm. I don't know if we've ever done that in World War I. I don't even know if you call it a dashboard. Would you call it cockpit control? Detailed <laughs> cockpit is usually what we go with in the product description. <laughs> right, um, and you do have two guns with this one. This one has a, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it has the- Vickers and the Lewis gun? Yeah, is that the Lewis it gun on top. It's a Lewis, it's, it doesn't have the shroud on it because it's aircraft. Mm -hmm. It does have a double, uh, double-sized uh, drum on there. Oh, extra um, capacity, why not? Right, right. Well, then when you're in the air, you, the, la the last thing you want to do is have to reload. Yeah, stand up and reload that thing. But there, there's <laughs> unique, in, in the dashboard of the real thing, there's like a slot in there where mm -hmm. you can have one extra drum magazine. So when you're flying and, and, and you run out of ammo on your top magazine, you actually pull the gun back. It has, it has, it comes, it has like like bar that swings down. Mm -hmm. Pull the gun back, you know, change out your, your ammunition drum and then push it back up into position. So so this one's above the, the, the Lewis gun here is above the propeller. Yep. And then you have the the uh, Vickers that actually shoots through the propeller. Mm -hmm. so. And the little gun sight on there, like I, I first noticed that, uh, I think with your Albatross yeah. is, is the first time I saw, I, I like that. It's just a fun playable aspect and usually it's at a really good height oh, where yeah. if you if you like to swoosh it around, you know, the pilot literally looks like he's got his eye up to it when he's shooting and that's kind of fun. And this this is, this is a plane that, that uh, it has a little wind, windscreen. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the first planes to actually had when it first came out it had a huge almost a full fairing for the the pilot. Mm -hmm. They didn't like it. It was too too much. Sure. Uh, but some pilots, I think Billy Bishop included, didn't even wear goggles. They would fly the planes because it had a wind <laughs> because it had a windscreen. They could kind of duck down behind the yeah, fairing sure. and not get you know oil and water and whatever else comes out of the engine in your face <laughs> and, and the weather nuts. of course birds and whatnot. So mm -hmm. it did have a, a, a glass. Uh, a little windscreen, which is not normal. It was not typical for, for planes of this era. So, um, yeah, lots of printed elements, mm -hmm. some sweet brick arms. Oh. Construction wise, super swooshable. Oh, right, I like yeah, the, yeah, uh, uh, the 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 bi wing connection. You know, I don't know if you guys have ever tried building a, a bi wing plane yourself at home, but that can be very tricky. Dan has done a great job on this one. It is, um, it is quite sturdy. And yeah. It does have the, the ailerons, do they only go down? I, I had it originally, so they went up. But there was a significant gap in there. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the gap, so this is my uh, sort of halfway in between. Yeah, uh, it's not perfect, but you know, it, at least it does what it's supposed to do. It's a good transition to Lego, yeah. though, because I, I think that the the look of it when it's like that is more important than the functionality of being able to go either direction. Yeah, yeah. So you could you could put the flaps down like mm -hmm. if we're landing or whatever. Um, it does have a, a sticker set. The, the, the tail yep. number is a sticker, of course. The bottom the, roundels. The Z on the top is a sticker, mm -hmm. and then the rondelles at the bottom. Mm -hmm. so, Fun little plane. We will bring them back. Um, I don't know if it, it may we it may, it may maybe or may November not be next year. Yeah, it may be before that. Uh, we did bring a lot of World War One aircraft back in production mm -hmm. uh, for the for the anniversary for the you know it, I guess the month is the anniversary the anniversary mm -hmm. of the armistice. Um, so that's why we celebrate the end of World War One in, yeah. in November because um, the armistice on November eleventh, nineteen eighteen. Yep, Great War Bricks, uh, definitely an, an important and interesting month. And cool to see the contributions uh, uh, that Mary of Dannon made as we as we continue to chug along. Uh, so that is going to be Dan's portion of the uh, of this video. We're going to jump over here and uh, hear from Landon real quick. The War Spite will be up next week. I'm super excited for that video as well. Excellent. Thanks. Okay, so moving over to the minifig, we have our World War One Canadian Ace. I think yes. probably the, the first of which that we've done, at least the first that we've paired with a, sure. a World yeah. War One plane. And it features some awesome 3D printing. Um, yes. What's he wearing, Lando? He's got this uh, awesome, awesome pilot cap here with some really cool... So that not only is this 3D printed, this is also UV printed. 
Um, so designed in-house, and then we printed it on our uh, 3D printers, and then loaded that up to the UV printers to get that insignia on the side and the buttons on the front. A uh, really, really awesome sculpt here. I think it captured that nice little lean to it too, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I think a lot of other caps just on the market, and Lego in general, they're always usually pretty straight on, um, but uh, I think we're, we're spending an extra effort to get our, our headgear kind of sitting more naturally on the minifigures. Which is kind of wild to me because, you know, Lego minifigures don't have ears. Right, yeah. <laughs> but still, you know what I mean? And so I think that's part of the reason why it is so symmetrical when Lego puts their hats on, their helmets on, etc. And so to try to be able to kind of capture that natural sure. fold is... is Cool. Hasn't yeah. necessarily been done before. Well, I think you know it's a natural evolution of a minifigure. It's I think when they initially designed it back in the what, '60s, I don't mm -hmm. know, uh, they probably weren't really thinking about like that necessarily. Sure. Like, what if they need to have tilting hats correctly? Mm -hmm. They probably don't have ears because it was like this is the simplest piece we could make for a head. I don't know. Uh, it, nonetheless, it is. I, I love the minifigure. So iconic looking. Yeah. It's fun to design uh, minifigures to this this scale, this aesthetics. These guys are just. They're made for displaying artwork. That's yeah. for sure. Um, pilot, uh, really heavy duty leather jacket, heavy duty leather boots. I'd imagine it gets a little bit chilly up there. So comes with a nice little stock Lego pilot cap mm -hmm. um, with the goggles. So cool, slick minifigure. Goes well with that. Yeah, fun to have both of them included, uh, depending on how you want to display and or play with your model. Landon, thanks for going over the minifig included with the SE5A. That is the Designer Studio episode. Thank you very much for watching.